and uh, we want to welcome everybody coming into this session in the ARAT conference for 2021. Uh, we dreamed at one stage that we may have well had a, a chance to uh, be in person in Bangkok, but of course, thank you to COVID, that's not possible. We then, then thought maybe we'll do a hybrid, maybe we can get some people there that's it, it's possible to get there, but uh, and then some online, but no, that's not been possible either. So whether you are in the morning, the afternoon or the evening, we want to say welcome to this. And we think you're going to find this in a, a, another really uh, stimulating session. Some of you have been involved with the networking uh, sessions that we've had. And uh, also uh, there is a chance in the chat box down the bottom to, uh, to be able to introduce yourself. Um, there is the Q&A there. And as we go through, if you come uh, up with questions, please put them in there and uh, we will have a chance to, uh, to look at those at the end. For those who don't know, my name is Fuzz Kitto and with Carolyn Kitto, uh, we uh, are the National Directors of Be Slavery Free and um, uh, one of the founders and the organizer on the organizing group for ARAT as well. So, um, so welcome to all of you. And we particularly want to uh, welcome our speaker today, uh, who is Professor Tomoya uh, Obakata. Um, Tom, as he's more commonly known as, and uh, we have had the joy of uh, having him on one of the webinars that we did uh, back earlier in the year. And uh, people found uh, what he had to say was incredibly helpful and stimulating. And I think you're going to find that again today. Um, he is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery for uh, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. And he looks continuously and listens to people involved uh, uh, in, in doing reports on slavery, uh, slave-like practices around the world. Uh, and he works with relevant governments and civil society uh, and other stakeholders and intergovernmental groups as well. And of course, the United Nations. He's also a professor of international law and human rights at Keele University in the United Kingdom. So Professor Tom, thank you so much for making the time and agreeing to come on. And we are looking forward to what it is that you're going to be saying and the things you want to share with you. So over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And uh, well, good morning, uh, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. I'm based in the United Kingdom, so it's uh, uh, morning here. But uh, I'd like to begin by th uh, congratulating uh, the organizers and all participants of the Asia Region Anti-Trafficking Conference. I have no doubt that you have been discussing a number of important issues facing Asia today in relation to human trafficking and exploitation. When I took up my role as the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery last year, I decided to focus on Asia in terms of my country missions during my tenure. So it is certainly nice to be able to connect with colleagues working in the region. Today for my talk, I will highlight some of the global challenges that we face, which are also pertinent to Asia. Back in 2015, the United Nations adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with a number of goals and targets to be achieved. Of particular importance is goal eight on decent work and economic growth. Under target 8.7 within this goal, states are to take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor, and modern slavery and human trafficking and secure the prohibition and elimination of the worst forms of child labor, including recruitment and use of child soldiers. And by 2025, end child labor in all its forms. Although some progress has been made, I'm afraid that we still have a long way to go as a large number of people continue to be trafficked and or subjected to slavery, forced labor and other slave-like practices. Main forms of exploitation in Asia include, but are not limited to, commercial sexual exploitation, domestic servitude, forced and early marriage, 
debt bondage and hazardous child labor. And the situation has worsened with the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, which continues to pose additional challenges in anti-slavery efforts globally. As you may recall, I provided an initial analysis of the impact of the pandemic on contemporary forms of slavery in my first report to the UN Human Rights Council last year. And although the situation has been constantly evolving since some of the findings in that report remain valid today, as many states, including those in Asia, are still struggling to contain the virus. For instance, pandemic has had a negative impact on law enforcement responses to contemporary slavery in Asia. This has been caused partly by shifting of resources by some states from anti-slavery efforts to fight the pandemic. This and other factors such as remote working implemented as part of national lockdown measures resulted in major delays in investigation, prosecution, and punishment of slavery, forced labor, and other slave-like practices. I have also discovered that the work of frontline organizations, including civil society organizations and trade unions, has been affected. Although some have been able to provide services remotely, many victims have not been able to access them in various parts of the world, including Asia. As a result, identification and protection of victims already held in contemporary forms of slavery have become very difficult. Another major impact is unemployment. According to the International Labor Office Organization and Asian Development Bank, Approximately 6% of working hours were lost in Asia and the Pacific alone during the first quarter of 2020. Now, this doesn't seem like a big number, but in practice translates into 247 million full-time jobs. An example of affected sector in Asia is the garment industry where a large number of factories had to suspend their operations due to cancellations of orders from other regions of the world. And this resulted in mass unemployment. Although workers in some high income states in the region have been able to receive protection through job retention and wider social security measures, this has not been the case for many others in middle and low income states. Even before the pandemic, a large number of people in Asia worked in the informal economy where protection from states had been limited or non-existent. Unemployment in a context of the pandemic has meant an increase in competition for scarce jobs and many people, many workers in Asia have had no choice but to accept even more exploitative or abusive jobs and working conditions which amount to slavery, forced labor, and other slave-like practices. Here, we need to pay attention to particularly vulnerable populations. In the garment industry in Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Vietnam, for example, women have been severely affected as they constituted the majority of the workforce in the sector. There have been disturbing reports of unemployed women resorting to so-called transactional sex in order to survive and support their family. Another example is people suffering from caste-based discrimination in South Asia who have also been disproportionately affected by unemployment. In addition, I have seen accounts of unemployed workers in Asia being pushed into illegal economy, which is mainly controlled by criminals. For example, exploitation in forced prostitution and other criminal activities such, such as drug production and trafficking, forced begging and theft. In contrast, there are some sectors which actually have seen a 
surge in labor demand during the pandemic, mainly those providing essential goods and services such as health and social care, agriculture, transport, cleaning, and medical supplies. Workers in these sectors have been able to retain their jobs, but I have seen evidence of exploitative and abusive working conditions, such as low or no wages, long working hours, inability to take annual or sick leave, violence at workplace, and an increased risk of COVID-19 infection. The garment industry in Asia, for example, has been shifting to production of PPE, but unfortunately, indicators of forced labor have been reported in states like China, Malaysia, and Pakistan. Harsh working conditions have also been noted in the Thai and Indonesian fishing industry as well. We also need to pay attention to Asian migrant workers in other regions, such as the Middle East. Domestic workers, mostly women, have been experiencing an increase in workload in order to ensure cleanliness and hygiene for the employers. Despite this, many households reduced their wages or even stopped paying them. Construction industry is another example where migrant workers have been forced to live in overcrowded accommodation, which has dramatically increased COVID-19 infection among them. Another side effect of the pandemic is its impact on children. School closures have resulted in an increase in child labor, including hazardous jobs which are prohibited under international human rights and labor law, particularly the ILO Convention on the Worst Forms of Child Labor, which has been universally ratified last year. I have also seen evidence of forced and early marriage of girls in some states in Asia in exchange for financial gains. In addition, as children have been spending more time online during the pandemic, there has been a growth of online child grooming, pornography, and sexual exploitation. It is important to recognize that the vast majority of the UN member states, including Asian nations, have implemented some forms of protection, ranging from job retention schemes and cash transfer to enhanced social security and unemployment benefits. For example, Bhutan, Singapore, South Korea, and Sri Lanka have provided incentives to businesses and employers to hire unemployed young people and other vulnerable populations. Indonesia's pre-employment card program has provided vouchers for training and reskilling to unemployed workers, which was said to have benefited 5.6 million unemployed workers, particularly in the informal sector. In addition, cash transfers have been implemented for displaced persons those residing in rural areas and migrant workers in states such as Cambodia, China, India, Japan, and the Philippines. However, these are temporary by their very nature and many of them have been regarded as insufficient, particularly in low income Asian states. Additional obstacles such as corruption, benefit fraud, excessive bureaucracy, discrimination towards certain groups of unemployed workers, such as migrant workers, and those held in scheduled caste, have also emerged in Asia and beyond. All of these certainly cast some doubts on the effectiveness and appropriateness of various protection measures implemented during the pandemic. There are wider lessons to be learned. As with other emergency situations, the key causes of contemporary forms of slavery, particularly poverty, inequality, and discrimination have been exacerbated during the pandemic. And this is particularly true in Asia. 
the most vulnerable in this regard are women, children and young people, indigenous peoples, minorities, migrant workers, internally and externally displaced persons, workers with disabilities, and older workers. Governments must do more to eradicate these causes. At the very minimum, equal access to education, training, decent work, as well as labor and social protection must be secured through legislative and other means in order to prevent these vulnerable people from being subjected to contemporary forms of slavery. They must also implement awareness raising and other measures to change the deep-rooted culture of discrimination prevalent at local or community level. This will require closer dialogue, cooperation, and coordination with community leaders, civil society organizations, trade unions, national human rights institutions, and other relevant stakeholders. For my part, I will promote a victim-centered approach through my mandate and examine the experiences of these vulnerable groups closely during my tenure. In so doing, I will propose relevant and practical recommendations to safeguard their human rights. This year, my upcoming report to the UN Human Rights Council in September will focus on displaced persons such as refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced and stateless persons, many of whom reside in Asia and the Pacific. Another important lesson is that we need to pay closer attention to the interactions among the formal, informal and illegal economies in facilitating contemporary forms of slavery. Precariousness, vulnerability, exploitation, and abuse increase as workers move from the formal to the informal economy and from the informal to the illegal one, which is controlled by criminals. These movements are more visible among the most marginalized in the global south, including some parts of Asia. Governments must ensure that workers do not fall into this vicious cycle. In this regard, formalizing informal work is an important step forward as this will strengthen the rights of all workers. They can then also uh, collect taxes properly, which in turn can be used to invest in businesses and workers, gradually facilitating economic growth and good governance. In addition, the involvement of criminals and more dangerous, or including more dangerous organized crime and terrorist groups in human trafficking and exploitation in illegal economies must be addressed effectively. Women and girls have been subjected to sexual exploitation and forced marriage, and others have been forced into a variety of criminal activities, as I explained earlier. Their operations are highly sophisticated and dangerous as they employ tactics such as bribery, intimidation and violence, and money laundering in order to minimize risks and maximize legal gains. In my upcoming report to the General Assembly in October, I will be analyzing the role of these criminal groups in contemporary forms of slavery and some of the ways to tackle their involvement. Further, it has become clear that businesses and employers have been taking advantage of the pandemic to abuse and exploit vulnerable workers in various parts of the world, including Asia. Many of them do not always cooperate with governments and non-governmental stakeholders to tackle slavery, forced labor and other slave-like practices as maximization of profit is their main priority. Here, we need to send a united message to the business community that this can be achieved without sacrificing 
the human rights of workers. Robust protection of their rights, including trade union rights and just and favorable conditions of work is more likely to enhance productivity on a part of workers, which in turn will lead to profitability in the long run. I therefore urge businesses and employers to take human rights due diligence in their operations more seriously in line with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Governments must also do more to hold them accountable as I have seen evidence of them not enforcing criminal, labor, health and safety laws and regulations rigorously. This unfortunately facilitates a culture of impunity and there is an urgent need to tackle this. There are wider challenges we face today globally. The use of modern technologies such as the internet, social media, and the dark web to recruit, traffic, and exploit victims is alarmingly becoming more common in modern times. Two years ago, my predecessor, Ms. Ermila Bola, appeared in a BBC documentary about mobile phone apps and other technologies being used to buy and sell migrant workers in the Middle East. This is a pressing issue as many of these workers come from Asia. When I started my term last year, I have sent several communications to both governments and technology companies, including Apple, Google, and Facebook to facilitate constructive dialogue and intend to follow up this issue through a thematic report, possibly together with other mandate holders. Finally, there is scope to enhance international solidarity and cooperation to combat contemporary forms of slavery. As with other issues of international concern, low and medium income states, including those in Asia, have been particularly struggling to implement effective anti-slavery actions due to a lack of infrastructure or resources. High income states have a moral as well as le legal duty under the United Nations Charter, as well as international human rights law to assist others in need. Stronger partnership with regional and international organizations, including financial institutions should also be strengthened as some states are not always forthcoming in accepting their assistance. As the Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery, I stand ready to work with all stakeholders at the national, regional, and international levels to promote constructive dialogue and stronger partnership so that together we can end contemporary forms of slavery sooner rather than later and achieve target 8.7 of Sustainable Development Goal 8. There are several ways you can engage with me directly in this regard. First is to respond to calls for input, which I issue every year in preparation of my thematic reports to the UN Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. I regard this to be very important as I can obtain first-hand information from a wide variety of sources to conduct an objective assessment. Submissions from various stakeholders also allow me to reflect their voices in identifying relevant issues and propose concrete recommendations to be followed. In this regard, I particularly welcome submissions from survivors, including organizations representing their interests. Second way is through country visits I conduct each year. I have issued a number of requests to states in Asia and the Pacific, including Fiji, India, Nepal, and Vietnam, and I am due to visit Sri Lanka later this year. 
These visits helped me to connect with the important stakeholders at the national level, including survivors of contemporary forms of slavery. And once again, I can reflect their voices and concerns at various levels of governance, such as the Human Rights Council. As I said earlier, my focus for country visits in East Asia and the Pacific, and I urge states to respond positively to my requests for a visit so that I can conduct an objective assessment and promote constructive dialogue to address contemporary forms of slavery together. Finally, I sent urgent communications to governments as well as private entities such as businesses upon receipt of allegations of human rights violations individually and together with other mandate holders such as the Special Rapporteur on Human Trafficking and the Working Group on Business and Human Rights. As an example, communications have been sent to a number of companies as well as the government of China recently in order to seek clarification on the allegations of forced labor of Uyghur minorities in Xinjiang province. I would encourage stakeholders in Asia to contact me through an established channel should allegations arise in relation to contemporary forms of slavery so that I can work directly with relevant governments and other stakeholders to address them in a timely manner. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to working with important stakeholders and colleagues in Asia through my role as the Special Rapporteur during my tenure. Professor Tom, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, that has given a, a, a really good broad um, sort of understanding of some of the things that are happening and particularly your role in the United Nations. The United Nations has always had a particularly important role in uh, dealing with human rights. And uh, of course, it was set up uh, out of uh, the, the atrocities of, uh, uh, of wars uh, and uh, was a place where, uh, where countries could come together to actually tackle these problems together. So um, there will be a number of questions, I'm sure, that come up uh, in regard to that. Um, some have come up already. And again, to people who want to participate in the uh, uh, in questions down the bottom under Q&A, uh, you'll see that down the bottom there, second from the right on most of your screens, uh, Q&A, please put your questions in there. And uh, I'll now hand over Carolyn to uh, start to field some of those questions. Great. Uh, thank you again, Professor Tom. Very Always very helpful to get your... Um, uh, they talk about helicopter parents. You're probably a helicopter human rights person <laughs> that has your finger on the view that's happening um, across across the globe. So I'll, I'll start, there are some quite specific questions that have come up in the Q&A, but I'll start with a couple. Um, many governments, in fact, most of the governments in the countries that we work in actually have laws that cover slavery. And, and some of them are very good, um, but there is no rule of law or enacting those laws. What do you see as uh, the role of the UN and what do you see as the role of NGOs and civil societies in holding those governments to account? Well, certainly, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, obviously, the states are primarily responsible for prosecuting and punishing slavery. And as you have highlighted, the vast majority of the countries already do have legislation. The problem then, it, when it comes to that, is law enforcement, uh, and that is being hampered for a wide variety of reasons, such as the emergency situations uh, like the COVID-19 pandemic or other deep rooted problems such as corruption and, and things like that, which all of which make it, uh, it quite difficult to enforce them in practice. And my in role as a United Nations, uh, obviously I am an invest in independent investigator. So what I can do on my part is investigate these uh, uh, matters and, 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 you know, actively you know, raise awareness and publicize findings at the, the national and international and re regional levels. And hopefully that may, uh, to an extent, put some pressure on various states to act more promptly uh, 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 you know, uh, to enforce these uh, laws and regulations and protect uh, 
victims. And I think that that's one thing. And I also do, uh, once again, on, through country visits and other means and hold uh, informal and formal dialogues with states. Uh, 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 so, so I think that would also help. Uh, uh, my job is not just to you know, again, criticize, 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 but to also highlight good practices that may already exist and recognize, you know, they actively share those good practices among different stakeholders so that others can learn from each other. I think that's important. That's where uh, I can come in and, and to kind of uh, disseminate information about good practice. And, and if there are areas of concern, I will also highlight that, uh, frankly, with states so that they can uh, uh, kind of uh, consider, obviously, uh, improving in their respective situations. And the role of civil society sector is, is, is particularly important in actually you know, reflecting their voices and the voices of their victims in particular. And they have to be part of the decision-making process in all anti-slavery efforts. If they are being excluded, I don't think you, know, you can implement a truly effective response because you are implementing something that may not actually benefit the victims or civil society organizations or to address the root causes. So it is important for governments to listen actually to the non-governmental stakeholders, particularly survivors or victims in, in Asia and beyond. And they can also, again, facilitate that, that you know, transparency, accountability through pub, you know, publication, report, examinations. And I do hope that they will communicate those with me so that, as I said, I constantly you know, look for information and, and that, you know, I do rely on your support in the future to send me information so that I, I can conduct a, a more objective assessment. And I will stop there. I hope I answered the question, but I'm happy to follow up. Um yeah, I, you've said a couple of times that you're happy to receive input from people. Are, are you okay if Joe puts your email address in the chat? Is that the best way to contact well, well, you? Well, I mean, if you want to send me information, there is a, a, a proper uh, email. So the, if you put, put that in my work email, that doesn't work. So uh, I can just uh, uh, type that now. Uh, hold on, let me just... Uh... That's uh, that's the official email uh, account, and that goes to the uh, 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 the OHCHR, and, and then we will receive uh, 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 information. And there is a separate channel for sending communications that relates to urgent communications. So if you see the cases of people you know, being held slavery in front of your eyes, and if you want to contact me directly, then there's a that's an urgent communication procedures that gets to me quite quickly than. Uh, uh, usual, and then then I will be in a position to work directly with the government straight away, uh, compared to you know other uh, you know mechanisms which may take uh, a longer. Uh, um, once again, that is to uh, again we act, act, act up on allegations. So uh, it is my job to kind of see clarification, and if something's not being done, and I re recommend the government to take certain actions to uh, you know address that particular situation. Yeah, great. Excellent. So that email address is in the chat. Um, so please um, feel free to uh, to put that um, through. Write it down. Um, write it down because it'll disappear when this finishes. But we'll certainly send that out afterwards with our sure. information. And unfortunately, so but for, for, for this year, my reports are already finished. So they are now being uh, translated in diff uh, different languages. So as I said, the one on displacement will be published in, in September and one of uh, 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 organized criminal groups will be in, in October. But next year, I'll be hoping to examine you know, other issues such as that technology or potentially other vulnerable populations, which I'm yet to uh, determine, but we will. I will issue a call for inputs in advance so that uh, you can all uh, forward your information. Excellent, that's fabulous. Um, just um, a, a question. Um, some, some NGOs are finding that um, governments are bringing in or have in brought in laws that are trying to control what NGOs who receive overseas or international funding are actually able to do. And this, uh, this is concerning in the impact that it has with people working with people in modern slavery, because often um, helping survivors not only requires um, practical help, but it also requires advocacy work. And some of that is being stifled. Um, 
what can the United Nations do and what can NGOs do to engage in this question around um, foreign funding of NGOs working on human rights issues? Yes, certainly. I think that's a, that's and happening in various parts of the world, uh, not particularly, you know, not just in Asia. And I think that indeed is a, a, a disturbing scenario. NGOs should be able to work uh, freely without, uh, you know, uh, influence from uh, the restriction from from the governments. And uh, for my part, uh, certainly, I do address the issue of contemporary forms of slavery. But we also have a special rapporteur on human rights defenders. Uh, 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 as well, and she's also working around the clock to work with the governments. That we independent uh, special rapporteurs can that work directly with the governments in ha having in informal and formal consultations and dialogue and, and so on. But the United Nations, the Human Rights Council, should bring that onto the agenda and actively debate and discuss it and propose uh, uh, solutions. And, and so, so that's you know, we can do our part in, in investigating and, and bring that to light. But I think there must be a political will at the, at the Human Rights Council, as well as the General Assembly in saying this is not an acceptable behavior. Uh, and, and therefore that all civil society organizations must be able to conduct their businesses without any interference of, of, of any kind, particularly the financial pressure. I, I think that's, uh, 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 you know, is, is uh, uh, negative trend and, and what the NGOs can do, once again, do communicate with us uh, uh, so that we can bring these uh, you know, facts to light and through our reports. And then we can certainly communicate that, uh, to governments as well if that's an urgent uh, uh, inquiry. Once again, communications can be sent to a special rapporteur on human rights defenders as well so that she can marry uh, from Ireland. She can address that and that side of issues directly to the governments. And if that's hampering, that NGO sectors in, for example, the anti-slavery sector, then yes, feel free to communicate with me, then I'm very happy to uh, address it. Mm, great, excellent. Now, there's a few questions here around the TIP report, um, which has recently um, been released. And we're not, we're not going to ask you to comment on the TIP report, so you can relax. Um, <laughs> but the question is, does your work contribute to the report to their report, or does the TIP report contribute to your work in any well, way? Well, yeah, I do not personally uh, make any contributions, but I do look at them, uh, particularly in highlighting some of the good practices and some of the uh, trends. And so for in my upcoming report to the General Assembly in Organized Crime, I have kind of uh, looked at what type of, for example, organized criminal groups are operating in different parts of the world. And in, in some, some cases, they do provide uh, a good examples and that, uh, but and, uh, that's not the only, for example, source of information that I rely on. Uh, my, my job, once again, is to provide a, an objective assessment. So in, in addition to the tip report, that information will be verified through other sources. So I always make sure to have a balanced uh, approach. And I do appreciate that there's lots of different opinions about that report. But uh, you know, again, the statistics and so on is not always uh, accurate and so on. But some of the examples that they highlight uh, uh, can be useful for, useful for me to form an, an informed opinion. Mm, OK. Um, shifting gear just a little bit to the more uh, Western side of Asia and um, a question from a person working in an NGO in, uh, in Nepal who is primarily working with uh, delete persons and the rights of the delete. And, and the question is around um, how does the issue of caste get raised in an appropriate way in order to address uh, contemporary forms of slavery? How, how do you raise that issue? Well, I mean, that's, 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 that's my job. I, uh, and one of the, uh, uh, the priority groups that I promise to focus on is, is minorities. Uh, and within that, the perhaps broad umbrella, uh, 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 religious, linguistic, and ethnic minorities, and potentially uh, emerging an area of uh, sexual minorities. And, and they uh, uh, are among the most vulnerable in terms of contemporary forms of slavery. So uh, uh, yeah, I will, in the future, will do a particular thematic report on that and, and focus on Dalits and, on, and others, for example, in Africa, those held in descent-based uh, uh, descent slavery. Yesterday, I issued a statement with a special rapporteur on Mali about the ongoing violence against those held in descent-based slavery. So, uh, and, and once again, I can you know, raise an issue with that, that statement 
and 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 or do a thematic report. And once again, your communication uh, uh, and. and to me is quite quite vital so that I can get this up to date information. And if necessary, I can raise uh, a statement like that uh, sooner rather than later, within 48 hours or something like that, uh, and, and, and then work with the government. But it is wow. uh, it, it, that's an important to... issue. Uh, I, I, I promise you, I promise to look you know, at the issue of caste-based discrimination and also descent-based uh, slavery. Uh, they uh, are among my uh, priorities. That's um, that's fabulous. You can we never we don't actually think from our place in the world of the UN being responsive to something in forty eight hours. But it is so heartening to know that there is a way of triggering a response um, when you're fed the right kind of information. So we really appreciate that. Well, well depending on the nature for something allegations and things like that, it does take a while to uh, so, so you know we have to give a uh, government enough time to respond uh, as courtesy, and that's a part of the process. But uh, urgent, the sooner we receive the information, the better. So uh, again, establish you know uh, three established channels. Uh, uh, please do you know, for for me any information. Mm, great, excellent. Um, so there's also some questions around. You talked about um, your your pra your um, approach of being victim centred, survivor centred. Um, can you share any um, any good experiences, any best practices? I mean, one of the big issues with survivors of human trafficking and slavery um, who've been previous survivors is with the pandemic, they become vulnerable to unemployment, potentially re-victimised. Have you heard of any practices or ways in which different groups are working effectively on those issues or governments? So, certainly. The, the, the first and foremost, it's important to recognise the role of civil society sectors, community leaders and, and trade unions uh, have been at the forefront of protection of unemployed workers during the pandemic. And I have seen a number of important initiatives, for example, trade unions working with the governments to create jobs and working with businesses to create jobs for uh, particularly affected workers like in, in informal sector and so on. And some of the governments, as I said in my speech, have provided that if, for example, cash incentives to women in different parts of the world. And so if you are a single mother or if you're working mothers, you get extra benefits, for example, if you are female. And something like that is to be, I think, is to be uh, acknowledged and, and widely shared. And obviously the uh, NGO sector have had also a difficult time uh, because of the lockdown and lack of funding, but many of them have moved to uh, providing online services. Uh, and that have benefited some, uh, you know, a good number of victims, certainly, but you know, that's not always the case in different parts of the world and not always, you know, you know every victim has an access to, for example, internet or phone and, and things like that uh, uh, in Western countries, maybe, but if you look at the remote you know, countries in Africa or Asia, uh, we can't expect them to be able to access these services, let alone they probably don't know these services do exist. So there is that kind of challenge as well in terms of uh, getting the information up to uh, these victims. And uh, again, uh, and lots of, uh, I've seen some good examples in Africa where the African governments are, you know, you know, implementing online uh, and education through online or TV or radio to, ch to children so that they can stay at school instead of being pushed into child labor and other forms of child exploitation. So there are a number of good, uh, you know, uh, emerging ex you know, examples uh, in all regions of the world, including Asia and the Pacific. Great, great. Now we're going to shift um, over to the Middle East and um, Margaret Stafford is asking, in, in the Middle East, um, it's, it's very difficult to have the place of NGOs recognised, um, especially for people to know that NGOs are there to help when sometimes the government systems um, are not necessarily helpful, particularly to domestic workers and women. So any advice? <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, of, of course, I mean, in many of these uh, at the Middle Eastern uh, countries that the uh, activities of the NGOs have been restricted. Uh, and that I, 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 you know, I, I, I am very much aware of that. And so I'm, I'm also hoping to uh, visit some of these countries. I've sent a request to Qatar, uh, which has accepted but postponed. Uh, uh, and I'm hoping to go there, be, uh, you know, may, maybe ne potentially next year before the world in World Cup, uh, and, and, and that, is, uh, that becomes all political, and also sent a request to Kuwait 
uh, other countries so that I can actually go in and meet with these uh, 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 you know, civil society and all stakeholders to, uh, again, the important thing is to promote a dialogue. I mean, you know, uh, uh, and it, again, antagonistic relationships may not always or always work. So it's one of the things I like to do is to promote, facilitate that dialogue being there, bring everyone together for a constructive dialogue so that instead of opposing each other, let's try to find a ways to work together. And that's an always a, a, a most effective ways. So uh, uh, I would always encourage governments to, uh, again, include all, all stakeholders in decision making, I, I think. And, that, and that's easier said than done, I, I suppose, from the NGOs uh, perspectives. But again, if there's anything I can do, please let me know. Then I'm very happy to facilitate dialogue and, and things like that if I, if I can with, with, in respective governments. Mm. That was tr spoken like a true, honest diplomat. So, um, <laughs> you know, we, we need to bring everyone to the table and, and having non-antagonistic conversations is, is the most important um, for us to do. And, um, yeah, we can only facilitate that when we're working well together. So that's, that's good. Um, there have been, um, uh, and, and you, um, you highlighted uh, this, previously um, the that COVID has uncovered a lot of things um, and it's uncovered a lot of systemic issues such as inequality discrimination um, racism a number of those sorts of things but but I guess the other thing is that the world has actually found a way to respond to a crisis um, it, in some places more successfully than others. What do you think we can learn from the successes of how COVID has been addressed for how we address what we believe is another crisis, which is contemporary forms of slavery in the world? Hmm. Well, uh, I, I suppose that the, uh, again, one of the good things, oh, I mean, it's not, I shouldn't say good, but I mean, I think the international solidarity and cooperation has become much stronger in responding to COVID. I mean, there's much to be done. There's no question about that. For example, in terms of circulation of vaccines and, and things like that, it's still lots of uh, you know, countries in global health and people are still suffering, they're still waiting. So there's a, a, a much to be done. But I, I think uh, it also highlights that, you know, uh, important contributions made by not just the governments, but other stakeholders who are you know, fighting with the pandemic day in and day out. Uh, and that I've, uh, I have also seen that is, has also, also been a case in terms of contemporary forms of slavery and human trafficking. All of these people are out there helping people held in slavery, forced labor, and other slave-like practices. And I think that type and, and that, that spirit of international solidarity uh, and not just international, national, regional, and international solidarity and cooperation. I think that is going to be even more crucial in times of crisis. Uh, and you know, people at different levels of governance working together communicate with each other to find a common solution. Uh, and we know, we, you know, whatever the political views that people hold, we all know that slavery is wrong. So we do share a common uh, uh, goal there. So I mean, and you know, so. It, it, seem to be it's much easier for a topic like slavery to find a common ground to uh, address it in even in times of, of uh, emergency I, I, I suppose and there's outpouring supports from uh, different sectors in, uh, in anti-slavery effort as well I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not I'm not sure if I've been able to answer that no, no, I, I think that's helpful and I think the clue is always how do we work together how do we share the responsibility how do we share um, respect the contribution that different groups have to make so yep. um, so that's um, that's really important now I know that looking at technology is your focus for next year but can you give us any tasters on how you think or hope or uh, technology might be able to help us? What are the technological tools? What are the tools? Yeah, of course. Uh, so, I mean, again, so as I said in my speech, I mean, there are these technologies that are being used to exploit victims, but there are other uh, emerging uh, good examples, such as the use of blockchain technology or artificial intelligence. And, and again, there's also use of uh, mobile phone apps where, where you can report the cases of of trafficking and slavery anonymously 
and things like that. So these are kind of uh, emerging group practices. I haven't conducted the sufficient research uh, investigation yet, so I can't really tell you exactly how these things are, are being played out. But that's what I'm hoping to uh, examine uh, uh, next year. Uh, uh, once again, uh, uh, the aim is to kind of highlight the examples that may be shared among different stakeholders and hope, hoping that uh, we can do this for other mandate holders such as uh, uh, Special Rapporteur on Human Trafficking and we also have a Special Rapporteur on Sale on Sexual Exploitation of Children where you know all these criminals heavily rely on technologies to exploit children online and offline and so on. So this is that we are kind of a thinking of and we also hold a regular consultation with technology companies which is also another positive uh, uh, things that we do so uh, we do have that communication lines open yep that's great that's uh, we're so looking forward to what you say in that area mm. we recently had an inquiry in australia a senate inquiry into the importing of forced labor into australia good forced trip, labor good goods work. into australia and the, uh, the, the report highlighted very strongly that governments actually need to get on the front foot of various technologies to actually get ahead of the perpetrators of the modern slavery that is happening in supply chains in particular. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Um, so uh, another, another question here. Um, what what do you see are some of the positive or encouraging practices that governments in Asia are implementing that um, that are helpful in addressing emerg um, emerging contemporary slavery or any good practice in business that you're seeing in Asia at the moment that uh, that it would be helpful for us to know about. Well, governments, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, helping, uh, preventing uh, people from falling into slavery, then I think a, a good number of countries in Asia and, and beyond are kind of, uh, again, providing equal access to uh, uh, all different uh, type, of, uh, type of workers, particularly vulnerable, uh, vulnerable populations, including women, children, uh, ethnic minorities, indigenous peoples, and internally and externally, displaced populations. So, so in, in number of country, you know, they have equal access to uh, a, a decent work and social security and, and things like that. And these, that, these needs to be copied and, and, and accepted by the vast majority of other countries and saying that, you know, uh, first and foremost, the governments need to appreciate that everyone contributes uh, to their national economy equally. So it is uh, plainly wrong to treat certain groups uh, more favorably than others, uh, particularly if, uh, I, I, you know, in my upcoming report to the Human Rights Council, I've been looking at expensive refugees, for example. Many of them actually have a very good qualifications, such as being a doctor, lawyers, teachers, and yet and they are excluded in a country like UK, perhaps Australia, uh, in engaging in that type of uh, professions. Now, but now, having said that, it, in light of the COVID, I have seen good examples in Europe, Latin America, and so on, where these refugees and displaced populations have actually have been at the forefront of the fight against the pandemic. I and mean, I think that, to me, is a you know, good examples. And in terms of businesses, and I think they need to do more. It's no question about it, because they are the ones who, who are exploiting these uh, vulnerable uh, victims. Uh, but I think there's an increased awareness among that at least a kind of a major corporate transnational corporation about the importance of human rights due diligence and, and the importance of it because at the end of the day, they do care about the image. They do care about the profit and they are very much aware of the power, for example, of social media in consumer boycotts and, and, and critique and also on spread quickly and that you know, can have an impact on, on their image and production and so on. So I think they, are more responsive to the, you know, to these kind of uh, issues, but they have to do it because they believe in it, not because they are kind of forced to do it. So it's important to bring that type of culture to uh, businesses, particularly the medium to kind of small businesses, which heavily rely on these workers in informal sector. And I think that's a, a, a key, uh, I think. And I've also seen good examples in terms of trade unions. Uh, again, they're negotiating with businesses to provide equal access to work, labor protection, and, and so on. Oftentimes we you know, do talk about NGOs, but um, I'm also hoping to do a thematic report on the role of trade unions at one point because we, that, they have been 
quite ignored uh, uh, in my in my view. They have not been on the agenda of anti-slavery efforts. So I'd like to uh, bring that to light. And, you know, and can explain and expose some of the good examples that may exist. Is it you know in, in the work that they do? Mm. I think, I, I mean, we've always tried to get a trade union um, speaker at Arash. We have not always been successful, uh, especially when we've wanted an Asian speaker, um, because, uh, you know, in many countries across Asia, um, trade unions are very marginalised or they don't exist. Um, so it's... Um, uh, or, or they're very controlled by the government or political parties. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you've got any insights into, um, you know, I, I totally agree with you that unions have a huge role here, but there are some places where they can't operate um, or they can't operate yet. So um, any insights into kind of alternatives that you've seen that help workers' voices to be heard, help them to organise and help them to protect each other? So yeah, I think I think that's quite uh, important. Uh, and, and oftentimes these workers are also neglected. I mean, are there like a, a trade union rights for, for example, refugees or migrant workers? And if, if they don't, I mean, they are not enjoying the rights guaranteed under the relevant international human rights and, and labour law yeah. and those are the issues that, that I would like to uh, you know highlight strongly uh, uh, to the international community. Mm, great thank you. Okay we've got a couple more here. Um, so in terms of this community of Ararat we've got probably a bit over 400 people who've registered for the conference. Um, so you, you've said that people can email you, which is fabulous. And I've already got a few people in the chat saying that they're going to send you an email. So watch your inbox. <laughs> um, but it's also the question of how, what could we do uh, as people spread across, well, we're spread across the world really, but predominantly in Asia and the Pacific. What can we do to enhance the work of the UN? And what can we do to... Um, to enhance, enhance our work on contemporary forms of slavery. What, what if you had a call to some best practices, what would they be? Well, I mean, obviously the sending us uh, information is, is most, you know, one of the most important things that, that you can do uh, and uh, you know, up to date, first hand information uh, on the experience of, of survivors and so on. All, all of these are always important to me and, and my mandate. I'm sure that is the same for uh, the special rapporteur on human trafficking. We are se two separate, uh, so I don't deal with human trafficking per se, but I'm more concerned about what happens after they have been trafficked. So that's a kind of basic, uh, distinction there, but we share, a, you know, these things are all, always interlinked, you know, we can't talk about one without the other. So it, it's always the same. Uh, and, and again, we, if we are able to visit your country, please do meet with me, uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, so that I can kind of uh, reflect your voice. And, and also, you know, it would be helpful if you could, could put me in touch with uh, and other relevant stakeholders that I can meet or, or contact uh, uh, so that I can kind of uh, expand our network or you know, stakeholders. And if any of the groupings in, within this conference, you know, is having a stakeholders forum and so on, and I'm very happy to uh, uh, come along and, and give a speech uh, and, and or participate in a webinar like, like this so that, uh, you know, I can kind of introduce myself and uh, we can establish a kind of a even informal uh, partnership. I mean, and I think that's a kind of a, for me, that's quite important. Uh, as I said, Dialogue and partnerships are, are some of the things that I highly value. So I, I do hope that you uh, keep that in mind. And just just as a footnote, Professor Tom is um, an early riser, so he's in London, but that works well for anyone in Asia to get him involved in anything that's um, that's happening online. And uh, we've certainly taken advantage of that on a couple of occasions. I think three occasions now. And have really appreciated that dialogue that uh, that you've provided us with. Um, so uh, another question is um, any uh, insights about sustainable and uh, successful approaches to re rehabilitation and reintegration of people who've been through trafficking, labour abuse, and child marriage. 
Yes. I mean, again, it's always difficult because there is no kind of a common picture right? because it all depends on the victims. Uh, so what's, what is important uh, uh, to me and to other Monday holder is to promote a victim center and a tailored uh, support. So you cannot provide the same support to women, children, and migrant workers because they have different individual needs. Even within children, there's lots of different uh, uh, to, uh, you know, levels of victimizations. That all depends. What is important for states is to be flexible uh, and to provide a tailored you know, support depending on individual needs, whether it is a kind of a medical and psychological support for a few, you know, few months uh, or, or, you know, different uh, education training or, or potentially at the, at the repatriation and reintegration into their communities. But these are not, it is important that the states are, are, are aware that they are not criminals. They are the victims of gross violations of human rights, so they are entitled to stay in their respective countries and receive uh, a, a appropriate level of protection that's under international human rights. So it doesn't matter if they are, you know, foreign, foreign illegal migrants. I mean, they are still human beings, and as such, they are entitled to the same level. Not may not be the same, but at least at minimum level of protection and, and to for their psychological and, and physical. Recovery. So setting a time 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 limit. For example, you have to you know you have to go home after ninety days, and and that's that's not acceptable to me, and, and to other mandate holders. Again, the government must be flexible to ensure that they are recovered, and then if they choose to you know to stay in, in their own countries, that should be facilitated. Once again, they are, they are not really taking on you know stealing other people's jobs. They are contributing equally to their own societies and economies. And I think it's important to send that message to the public authorities. They are contributors, not criminals, uh, uh, to be excluded. They are entitled to the same level of social and labor protection. And that's, that's quite important. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we, would, that we often say in workshops at Be Slavery Free is that when it comes to um, prevention, you can do it on mass. You can produce a brochure, you can put it on television, you can do it on billboards, and you can reach thousands and thousands, maybe millions of people. But once a person has experienced um, slavery-like practices and conditions impacting their own lives, each one of those people has to be treated individually because no two people will have that experience in the same way or will be helped in the same way. Absolutely. Um, so, so I think the tailored individual uh, uh, individual approach is is quite important, and I'm sure certain countries, or well, particularly NGOs, are very good at that. I'm not sure governments are actually doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Still, uh, in many parts of the world, not just in Asia, they are seen as as kind of a you know, perpetrators or, for example, criminal and immigration laws. So that's why that the Special Rapporteur on Human Trafficking just published a report on non-punishment principle, which is extremely important. Those people who have been trafficked and exploited should never be prosecuted and punished. They sh must be protected. I mean, that's that's crystal clear under international human rights law. And I fully support the Special Rapporteur on Trafficking on, on that particular point. And, 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 and so that needs to be out there. And some governments actually have provide extended that principle to victims of trafficking as well as slavery not every single uh, person who you know uh, uh, who has been exploited have been trafficked so so there is that distinction as well but i mean they are nevertheless uh, uh, share the common trait of being a, a victim of human rights violations so, so that's a kind of common ground that we can work on i think now th this next question might be a bit out of your um, realm, but you seem to be able to, <laughs> to navigate many of them. So the UNODC put out a report earlier this year about who are the perpetrators of um, modern slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, their conclusion was in examining all of the, uh, the cases that had happened around the world that by and large, most of it was organised crime. Yeah. Again. Um, so uh, does the UN support programs or are you aware of programs that address perpetrators beyond prosecution and incarceration? Well, I'm not personally aware of, of the UNODC implement. I'm sure that regional offices of UNODC actually work with governments to uh, 
do I mean, if, you, if you're talking about uh, rehabilitation of these criminals, I mean, I think I'm, I'm sure that is also important. Uh, many of these perpetrators have been actually victims of human trafficking and slavery as well. So mm -hmm. they're not necessarily hardcore criminals or organized criminal groups. If they're organized criminal groups or terrorist groups exploiting these individuals, they should go to jail. They should be prosecuted and punished properly with the appropriate penalties. But having said that, after that, if they have shown a sign of, uh, you know, improvement, remorse and so on, they should be reintegrated into society so that, you know, they can perhaps also, you know, help identify this uh, crime uh, uh, in, in the future. But I'm, unfortunately, I don't know exact specific examples of these programs. But I think, again, in addition to prosecution and punishment, yes, I think other side of the uh, uh, you know, other measures are, you know, I agree, uh, it's quite important. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we, we are actually, oh, we've got another one. Yep. Um, so this is another question. Um, in the UAE, uh, prosecution of citizens, citizens who have enslaved workers, uh, how do you get a kingdom in actually prosecuting? I'm not sure I actually totally understand the question, Margaret. Um, well, I mean, that may happen for you. I mean, not, I'm not just, I don't want to kind of, you know, pick just blaming one country or anything in, in, uh, in, in not just the Middle East, in, uh, in other countries where they have like migrant workers. I mean, it is not always a case that the perpetrators, such as private homes, like uh, domestic households, are prosecuted and punished uh, despite the law. And I think that's, that's wrong. Uh, and, and, and so there must be a system of a clear accountability. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, to hold these uh, uh, businesses, house, private household accountable, uh, no matter where they are, uh, be in UAE or Qatar or, or United Kingdom or, or, or Germany or United States of America or Canada. I mean, it's, it's, it's crystal uh, clear. And so, so the robust system of labor inspection uh, is, is, is quite important. Uh, in many, some countries, they do have, a, you know, in addition to police, they have a specific department for labor inspection that goes out to the field in checking and making sure that, that it's it's okay. So that sometimes works, but again, it's labor intensive. I mean, it's impossible to knock on every single, for example, farm or factory or, or, or restaurant uh, uh, catering. Uh, and so it's always that, but I think having a robust system of labor inspection is, is extremely crucial. And that is independent of the perhaps the executive and so they can provide an independent oversight of you know, all of these, working with the businesses and also trade unions. I think, again, partnership seems to work best in that kind of scenario. Mm, great. I'm um, going to hand back to Buzz. <laughs> there are um, uh, a, a number of calculations that have been done in regard to the scale of what's been happening. And this was mainly pre-COVID, but on our calculations, and particularly with Matt Friedman from the Mekong Club, uh, the estimation is 22,500 people, uh, sorry, 25,200 people per day are being caught in slavery. As NGOs, we are able to help in the realm of 150 people per day. So 150 people were able to help, uh, 25,200 per day are being caught in slavery on average calculation, of course, uh, as general. So how, how do you think we get that urgency uh, out there? Because we're not winning. Yeah, it is always, uh, I suppose, difficult because of clandestine and, and nature of all of these practices. It's always difficult to get the, uh, I suppose, identification at an early stage is, is, is the key, and, and, and I, I think. And I think that every single country has to do more to you know, I identify these cases, particularly in international trafficking. I mean, there must be a signs at the airports and seaports and so on where you can spot the signs uh, and, and, and things. And this is where also that, that the work of local authorities and also civil society and other organizations become extremely important because they are in a position perhaps to be able to reach out to these hidden victims. And I think, I think that's uh, uh, important. Many of these victims are exploited uh, uh, in legal economy, uh, uh, you know, even if it's a, it's a criminal offence. And so that makes it, uh, again, ex extra uh, uh, difficult, uh, I suppose. So, so it's, it's, there's no one single way to address it, but I think raising awareness and also, again, let these victims know that, that there are ways that they can report. I mean, of, most, in many cases, these victims even do not even know that they are victims of human trafficking, for example, or slavery. And I, I think, and I think the information must be out there. So governments must do more 
to provide information. Also, NGOs, you know, are, are again at the forefront of providing that kind of information too. And, and but that has to be supported by uh, governments, really. Thank you, because you le you've led right into the next question, <laughs> really well there, which right. is, uh, and we totally agree with you that that uh, people who uh, are perpetrators of, of modern slavery uh, needed uh, to be you know, uh, uh, held accountable and uh, come before the law. But we have so few convictions of modern slavery. What can we do to do that? Now, you, you've hinted on one thing there, which is the intelligence, but how do we get that intelligence coming together between countries, which is you know, one of the roles of the United Nations, how do, we, how do we get that intelligence coming together much more so that we can make the invisible visible? No, I think that's, that's the important point. I mean, the prosecution rate and punishment rate seems to be quite, uh, quite low, given the number of victims there are. And I think it's, again, uh, uh, is it that the police are not doing their jobs? I wouldn't say that. I mean, as many, many police forces and, and different parts of the world are doing their most, but I think one of the difficulty once again is that the testimony evidence from victims. If these victims are not properly protected uh, and are able to stay in their, you know, in the countries, if they are being deported, you can't get concrete evidence. Uh, and not from that, you know, not just for that reason alone, but I mean, all victims should be able to stay in, in destination, for, uh, you know, for you know, as long as they want, but particularly during you know, the criminal proceedings, so that they can provide a sufficient level of support, including witness protection if necessary, to provide uh, uh, testimony in a safe and secure manner. And International Criminal Justice Corporation is another key. The, the difficulty there is that uh, if you're talking about European Union, I don't know if any of the audience are from uh, at this region, there's a robust system, for example, we have a European police office, Europol, uh, and there's also lots of legal arrangements that there are, for example, European arrest warrant, European in, in investigation order. These are making things easier to exchange evidence intelligence. And mm -hmm. system like that doesn't exist at international level and let alone in Asia uh, where different legal traditions kind of merge in this particular region. That makes it difficult to exchange evidence. It has to go through the diplomats and go through the in, in, interior ministry and police and so on. The, the whole thing takes about a, a, a year. An yeah. average extradition uh, can take a, 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 at least a year to a few years uh, and, 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 and so on so because of these legal complications. And, and all of that, you know, in my view, should be uh, uh, streamlined. That's why we have an, a treaty like the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the Trafficking Protocol, which should be used to kind of make these things easier. But in practice, because of these uh, legal and political differences, and, and that makes it... Uh, because some certain aspects of human trafficking exploitation involving children, perceptions are quite different in Japan, for example, compared to Europe. Uh, so, so that you know, so those are practical difficulties that needs to be addressed, and I, I take that. Uh, and uh, you know, I, if uh, there's anything I can do to uh, kind of raise that awareness together with the UNODC and so on, I'd be very happy to uh, do so. That'd be really, really helpful because so many times there are national laws. Uh, against modern slavery, but it's an international crime. So one of the frustrations that, that many NGOs have that are working with people when they actually see what is happening, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, and, and one of the things we've done in, in ARAP and in previous conferences when we've been uh, in person, <laughs> if I were to gather in Bangkok, has been to actually map the intel coming from NGOs about where the currents are of where people are coming from and when they are going to. And so we put up on the wall these maps and we draw the currents of where people are coming from, where they're going through and where they're going to. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I guess the frustration that often has come out of a lot of people who come to Arat that are NGOs is, look, we pick this up all the time because we hear this, we see this, we are working with this, we understand this. But we are continually confined by national laws, but they literally fly over national boundaries to do that. So what, 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 what is, what's the role do you think the United Nations has? And you have mentioned this brief, uh, partly, I know. What's the role that the United Nations has in bringing that together to try and work on the international nature of uh, trafficking? 
it's it's very difficult. I think something like uh, uh, trafficking, it's more more, more not not necessarily regional, but more more like bilateral issues. If you're talking about someone being trafficked from Cambodia to Thailand, it is up to those two countries to work, work that out. So it is important to have that bilateral arrangement in in place where the information exchange and so on, or, or you know pre prisoners or a transfer and so on can be facilitated. And I think I think that's a starting point. And I do appreciate the frustration and so on. But I think you know it is also important that you know that many NGOs actually do have good connection with local police and prosecutors. They exchange information all the time. And I've seen lots of good practice even in, in, in Asia, Europe, in, in different parts of the world. But I, I think you know, again, you know, for those countries which do not have that, then I think that's one of the things that should happen. And if there's anything I can do to help that and uh, facilitating the dialogue, I'm, I'm more than happy to do it. Uh, at the, in terms of UN, like UNODC, uh, uh, they do not have that legal authority to, so that compared to, for example, European Union, that's a different mechanism, whether, you know, some of like ASEAN and so on Asian institutions want to facilitate that kind of a, supranational legal structure like like EU, that, that probably would be interesting. But I think there's lots of practical hurdle there, unfortunately. But working from the bilateral relations is, is more realistic, I, I think, than you know, tackling you know, from the international level in, in this kind of a cross-border trafficking and exploitation that is, I think. Thank you. You touched on something there again of frustration by a lot of observers, particularly with ASEAN, that says I, I, uh, they I, I, talk I, a lot <laughs> but we do not see much action coming out there, which really is needed across the region to be able to tackle a lot of this. So thank, thank you for, for actually raising that and mentioning that. Um, listen, uh, that's come to the end of our time, and, and we really want to thank you for uh, making your time, but not just making the time for your whole um, connection and offering to be engaged and to help out here. And it is so good for on the ground NGOs and organizations to, to know that, that you are there and there is this opportunity there to connect. Yeah, I also would like to th thank you for inviting me today because I, it's nice to be able to again connect with so many uh, good number over 100 uh, participants and uh, coming to this talk. And I, 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 I'm very touched and it's, it's very nice of them to. Uh, Kind of and come listen. And again, I, hopefully, this would be the beginning of a working relationship. I'll be in this post for the next five years, uh, uh, well, unless the human rights decides to abolish my post, which is highly unlikely because we still have this 2030 agenda. Uh, abolition of slavery is one of the key goals, anyway. So please do uh, uh, communicate uh, with me. And 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 that uh, you know, again, I will set, set, always send out the information about my country visit through my Twitter and and, and through my you know the UN. OHCHR account and things like that. So please, you know, keep that in mind and, and, and uh, do communicate. Uh, and uh, I, I'm here, I, I'm not one of those, you know, supranational kind of institution where you, no one can reach. No, that's not the case. We, I'm very reachable. So please forward any information and uh, relevant information and so on in the future uh, uh, from now on. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's would be very much appreciated. Well, thank you so much for that generosity and for that openness that that really does give uh, a lot of us in the NGO world a lot of confidence to know that there is a, a touch point and a, uh, a, an openness and generosity in that. And uh, we really want to thank you for that. So, um, uh, Professor Tom Obakato, thank you so much for, uh, for your time, your insights and your willingness. And thank you, everybody, for being involved in this session. And uh, we hope this has been helpful and open up again. Uh, opportunities and connecting points to be able to work together uh, on the, the global scale with the local realities. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Good afternoon. Good evening.